warrior, soldier, man at arms, get down. Scars on my hands and arms, hit town. Nigga know that man is arms, sit down. The Bank for International Settlements. I'm reading from a web page. The URL is at the top. It's by Patrick M. Wood from August Review. Preface. When David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski founded the Trilateral Commission in 1973, the intent was to create a new international economic order. To this end, they brought together 300 elite corporate, political, and academic leaders from North America, Japan, and Europe. Few people believed us when we wrote about their nefarious plans back then. Now we look back and clearly see that they did what they said they were going to do. Globalization is upon us like an 8.6 magnitude earthquake. The question is, how did they do it? Keep in mind they have no public mandate from any country in the world. They didn't even have the raw political muscle, especially in democratic countries where voting is allowed. They didn't have global dictatorial powers. Indeed, how did they do it? The answer is the Bank for International Settlements, BIS. Self-described as the bank for central bankers that controls the vast global banking system with the precision of a Swiss watch. This report offers a concise summation of BIS history, structure, and current activities. Introduction. The famous currency expert Dr. Franz Pick once stated, The destiny of the currency is and always will be the destiny of a nation. With the advent of rampant globalization, this concept can certainly be given a global context as well. The destiny of currencies are and always will be the destiny of the world. Even though the Bank for International Settlements is the oldest international banking operation in the world, it is a low-profile organization shunning all publicity and notoriety. As a result, there is very little critical analysis written about this important financial organization. Further, much of what is written about it is tainted by its own self-effacing literature. The Bank for International Settlements can be compared to a stealth bomber. It flies high and fast, is undetected, and has a small crew and carries a huge payload. By contrast, however, the bomber answers to a chain of command and must be refueled by outside sources. The Bank for International Settlements, as we shall see, is not accountable to any public authority and operates with complete autonomy and self-sufficiency. Leading up to founding, as we will see, the BIS was founded in 1930 during a very troubled time in history. Some knowledge of that history is critical to understanding why the BIS was formed. Some knowledge of that history is critical to understanding why the BIS was created and for whose benefit. There are three figures that play prominently in the founding of the Bank for International Settlements. Charles G. Dawes, Owen D. Young, John Marschacht of Germany. Charles G. Dawes was director of the U.S. Bureau of the Budget in 1921 and served on the Allied Reparations Commission starting in 1923. His latter work on stabilizing Germany's economy earned him the Nobel Prize in 1925. After being elected vice president under President Calvin Coolidge from 1925 to 1929 and appointed ambassador to England in 1931, he resumed his personal banking career in 1932 as chairman of the board of the City National Bank and Trust in Chicago, where he remained until his death in 1951. Owen D. Young was an American industrialist. He founded RCA, Radio Corporation of America, in 1919 and was its chairman until 1933. He also served as the chairman of General Electric from 1922 to 1939. In 1932, Young sought the Democratic presidential nomination but lost to Franklin D. Roosevelt. More on Jalmar Schacht later. In the aftermath of World War I and the impending collapse of the German economy and political structure, a plan was needed to rescue and restore Germany, which would also insulate other economies in Europe from being affected adversely. The Versailles Treaty of 1919, which officially ended World War I, had imposed a very heavy reparations burden on Germany, which required a repayment schedule of 132 billion gold marks per year. 
Most historians agree that the economic upheaval caused in Germany by the Versailles Treaty eventually led to Adolf Hitler's rise to power. In 1924, the Allies appointed a committee of international bankers led by Charles G. Dawes and accompanied by J.P. Morgan agent Owen Young to develop a plan to get reparations payments back on track. Historian Carol Quigley noted that the Dawes plan was largely a J.P. Morgan production. The plan called for $800 million in foreign loans to be arranged for Germany in order to rebuild its economy. In 1924, Dawes was chairman of the Allied Committee of Experts, hence the Dawes Plan. He was replaced as chairman by Owen Young in 1929, with direct support by J.P. Morgan. The Young Plan of 1928 put more teeth into the Dawes Plan, which many viewed as a strategy to subvert virtually all German assets to back a huge mortgage held by the United States bankers. Neither Dawes nor Young represented anything more than banking interests. After all, World War I was fought by governments using borrowed money made possible by the international banking community. The banks had a vested interest in having those loans repaid. In 1924, the president of Reichsbank, Germany's central bank at that time, was Jalmar Schacht. He had already had a prominent role in creating the Dawes Plan, along with German industrialist Fritz Thyssen and other prominent German bankers and industrialists. The Young Plan was so odious to the Germans that many credited it as a precondition to Hitler's rise in power. Fritz Dyson, a leading Nazi industrialist, stated, I turned to the National Socialist Party only after I became convinced that the fight against the Young Plan was unavoidable if complete collapse of Germany was to be prevented. Some historians too quickly credit Owen Young as the idea man for the Bank of International Settlements. It was actually Jalmar Schacht who first proposed the idea, which was then carried forward by the same group of international bankers who brought us the Dawes and Young plans. It is not necessary to jump to conclusions as to the extent of these elite bankers, so we will instead defer to the insight of renowned Georgetown historian Carol Quigley. Quote, the power of financial capitalism had another far-reaching plan, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world, acting in concert by secret governments arrived at in frequent meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank of International Settlements in Basley, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank in the hands of men like Montague Norman of the Bank of England, Benjamin Strong of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, Charles Rist of the Bank of France, and Jalmar Schacht of the Reichsbank, sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans, to manipulate foreign exchanges, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent rewards in the business world." Unquote. So here we have a brief sketch of what led up to the founding of the Bank for International Settlements. Now we can examine the nuts and bolts of how the BIS was actually put together. The Hague Agreement of 1930. The formation of the BIS was agreed upon by its constituent central bankers in the so-called Hague Agreement on January 20, 1930, and was in operation shortly thereafter. According to the agreement, the duly authorized representatives of the governments of Germany, of Belgium, of France, of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, of Italy, and of Japan of the one part, and the duly authorized representatives of the government of the Swiss Confederation of the other part assembled at the Hague Conference in the month of January 1930, have agreed on the following. Article 1. Switzerland undertakes to grant to the Bank for International Settlements, without delay, the following constituent charter, having force of law, not to abrogate this charter, not to amend or add to it, and not to sanction amendments to the statutes of the Bank referred to in paragraph 4 of the Charter, otherwise than in agreement with the other signatory governments. As we will see, German reparation payments, or lack thereof, had little to do with the founding of the BIS, although this is the weak explanation given since its founding. 
Of course, Germany would make a single payment to the BIS, which in turn would deposit the funds into the respective central bank accounts of the nations to whom payments were due. It would be the subject of another paper to show the shallowness of this operation. Money and gold were shuffled around, but the net amount that Germany actually paid was very small. The original founding documents of the Bank for International Settlements have little to say about Germany. However, we can look directly to the BIS itself to see its original purpose. Quote, the objects of the bank are to promote the cooperation of central banks and to provide additional facilities for international operations and to act as trustees or agent in regard to international financial settlements entrusted to it under agreements with the parties concerned, Unquote. Virtually every imprint reference to the BIS, including their own documents, consistently refer to it as the central banker's central bank. So the BIS was established by an international charter and was headquartered in Basli, Switzerland. Bank for International Settlements Ownership According to James C. Baker, pro-BIS author of the Bank for International Settlements Evolution and Evaluation, quote, The BIS was formed with funding by the central banks of six nations, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the United Kingdom. In addition, Three private international banks from the United States also assisted in financing the establishment of the BIS, unquote. Each nation's central bank subscribed to 16,000 shares. The U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, did not join the BIS, but the three U.S. banks that participated got 16,000 shares each. Thus, the U.S. representation at the BIS was three times that of any other nation. Who were these private banks? Not surprisingly, they were J.P. Morgan and Company, First National Bank of New York, First National Bank of Chicago. On January 8, 2001, an extraordinary general meeting of the BIS approved a proposal that restricted ownership of BIS shares to central banks. Some 13.7% of all shares were in private hands at that time, and the repurchase was accomplished with a cash outlay of $724,956,050. The price of $10,000 per share was over twice the book value of $4,850. It was not certain what the repurchase accomplished. The BIS claimed that it was to correct a conflict of interest between private shareholders and BIS goals, but it offered no specifics. It was not a voting issue, however, because private owners were not allowed to vote their shares. Sovereignty and Secrecy it is not surprising that the BIS, its offices, employees, directors, and members share an incredible immunity from virtually all regulation, scrutiny, and accountability. In 1931, central bankers and their constituents were fed up with government meddling in world financial affairs. Politicians were viewed mostly with contempt, unless it was one of their own who was the politician. Thus, the Bank for International Settlements offered them a once-and-for-all opportunity to set up the apex the way they really wanted it, private. They demanded these conditions and got what they demanded. A quick summary of their immunity explained further below includes diplomatic immunity to persons and what they carry with them, that is, diplomatic pouches, no taxation on any transactions, including salaries paid to employees, Embassy-type immunity for all buildings and or offices operated by the BIS. No oversight or knowledge of operations by any government authority. Freedom from immigration restrictions. Freedom to encrypt any and all communications of any sort. Immunity from any legal jurisdiction. Further, members of the BIS Board of Directors, for instance, Alan Greenspan, are individually granted special benefits immunity from arrest or imprisonment, and immunity from seizure of their personal baggage, save in flagrant cases of criminal offense, save in flagrant cases of criminal offense, inviolability of all papers and documents, immunity from jurisdiction even after their mission has been accomplished for acts carried out in the discharge of their duties, including words spoken and writings, Exemption for themselves, their spouses, and children from any immigration restrictions, from any formalities concerning registration of aliens, and from any obligations relating to national service in Switzerland. 
the right to use codes in official communications, or to receive or send documents or correspondence by means of couriers or diplomatic bags. Lastly, all remaining officials and employees of the BIS have the following immunities. Immunity from jurisdiction for acts accomplished in the discharge of their duties, including words spoken and writings, even after such persons have ceased to be officials of the bank. Exemption from all federal, cantonal, and communal taxes on salaries, fees, and allowances paid to them by the bank. Exempt from Swiss national obligations. Freedom for spouses and family members from immigration restrictions. Transfer assets and property, including internationally, with the same degree of benefit as officials of other international organizations. Of course, a corporate charter can say anything it wants to say and still be subject to outside authorities. Nevertheless, these were the immunities practiced and enjoyed from 1930 onward. On February 10, 1987, a more formal acknowledgment called the Headquarters Agreement was executed between the BIS and the Swiss Federal Council and basically clarified and reiterated what we already knew. Article 2. Inviolability. The buildings or parts of buildings surrounding land, which whoever may be the owner thereof, are used for the purposes of the bank shall be inviolable. No agent of the Swiss public authorities may enter therein without express consent of the bank. Only the president, the general manager of the bank, or their duly authorized representative shall be competent to waive such inviolability. The archives of the bank and, in general, all documents and any data media belonging to the bank or in its possession shall be inviolable at all times and in all places. The bank shall exercise supervision of and police power over its premises. Article 4. Immunity from Jurisdiction and Execution The bank shall enjoy immunity from criminal and administrative jurisdiction, save to the extent that such immunity is formally waived in individual cases by the president, the general manager of the bank, or their duly authorized representative. The assets of the bank may be subject to measures of compulsory execution for enforcing monetary claims. On the other hand, all deposits entrusted to the bank, all claims against the bank, and the shares issued by the bank shall, without the prior agreement of the bank, be immune from seizure or other measures of compulsory execution and sequestration, particularly of attachment within the meaning of Swiss law. As you can see, the BIS, its directors and employees, past and present, can do virtually anything and everything they want with complete secrecy, immunity, and with no one looking over their shoulders. It was truly a banker's dream come true, and it paved the international freeway for the rampant financial globalism that we see manifest today. Day-to-day -day operations. Acting as a central bank, the Bank of International Settlements has sweeping powers to do anything for its own account or for the account of its member banks. It's like a two-way power of attorney. Any party can act as agent for any other party. Article 21 of the original BIS statutes define day-to-day -day operations. Buying and selling of gold coin or bullion for its own account or for the account of central banks holding gold for its own account under reserve in central banks, accepting the supervision of gold for the account of central banks, making advances to or borrowing from central banks against gold, bills of exchange, and other short-term obligations of prime liquidity or other approved securities, discounting, rediscounting, purchasing, or selling with or without its endorsement bills of exchange, checks, and other short-term obligations of prime liquidity, buying and selling negotiable securities other than shares for its own account or for the of central banks, discounting for central banks' bills taken from their portfolio and rediscounting with central banks' bills taken from its own portfolio, opening and maintaining current or deposit accounts with central banks, accepting deposits from central banks on current or deposit account, accepting deposits in connection with trustee agreements that may be made between the BIS and governments in connection with international settlements, accepting such other deposits that, as in the opinion of the Board of the Bank of International Settlements, come within the scope of the BIS functions. The Bank of International Settlements also may act as an agent or correspondent with any central bank, arrange with any central bank for the latter to act as its agent or correspondent, 
enter into agreements to act as trustee or agent in connection with international settlements, provided that such agreements will not encroach on the obligations of the BIS toward any third parties? Why is the agency an important issue? Because any member of the network can obscure transactions from onlookers? For instance, if Brown Brothers Harriman wanted to transfer money to a company in Nazi Germany during World War II, which was not politically correct at that time, they would first transfer the funds to the BIS, thus putting the transaction under the cloak of secrecy and immunity that is enjoyed by the BIS, but not by Brown Brothers Harriman. Such laundering of Wall Street money was painstakingly noted in Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler by Anthony C. Sutton. There are a few things that the BIS cannot do. For instance, it does not accept deposits from or provide financial services to private individuals or corporate entities. It is also not permitted to make advances to governments or open current accounts in their name. These restrictions are easily understood when one considers that each central bank has an exclusive franchise to loan money to their respective government. For instance, the U.S. Federal Reserve does not loan money to the government of Canada. In like manner, central banks do not loan money directly to private or corporate clients of their member banks. How decisions are made. The board of directors consists of the heads of certain member central banks. Currently, these are Naut H. E. M. Wellink, Amsterdam, chairman of the board of directors. Hans Tietmeyer, Frankfurt A. M. Main, vice chairman. Axel Weber, Frankfurt A. M. Main. Vincenzo Desario, Rome. Antonio Fazio, Rome. David Dodge, Ottawa. Toshihiko Fukui, Tokyo. Timothy F. Geithner, New York. Alan Greenspan, Washington. Lord George, London. Herv Hanown, Paris. Christian Neuer, Paris. Lars Heikenstein, Stockholm. Mervyn King, London. Guy Quaden, Brussels. Jean-Pierre Roth, Zurich. Alphonse Vicomte, for Platzi, Brussels, 16. Of these five members, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Switzerland are currently elected by the shareholders. The majority of directors are ex officio, meaning they are permanent and are automatically a part of any subcommittee. The combined board meets at least six times per year in secret and is briefed by the BIS management on financial operations of the bank. Global monetary policy is discussed and set at these meetings. It was reported in 1983 that there is an inner club of the half dozen central bankers who are more or less in the same monetary boat. Germany, U.S., Switzerland, Italy, Japan, and England. The existence of an inner club is neither surprising nor substantive. The whole BIS operation is 100% secret anyway. It is not likely that members of the inner club have significantly different beliefs or agendas apart from the BIS as a whole. How the BIS works with the IMF and the World Bank. The interoperation between the three entities is understandably confusing to most people, so a little clarification will help. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, interacts with governments, whereas BIS interacts only with other central banks. The IMF loans money to national governments, and often these countries are in some kind of fiscal or monetary crisis. Furthermore, the IMF raises money by receiving quota contributions from its 184 member countries. Even though the member countries may borrow money to make their quota contributions, it is in reality all taxpayer money. The World Bank also lends money and has 184 member countries. Within the World Bank are two separate entities, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD, and the International Development Association, IDA. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD, focuses on middle-income and creditworthy poor countries, while the IDA, International Development Association, focuses on the poorest of nations. In funding itself, the World Bank borrows money by direct lending from banks and floating bond issues, and then loans this money through IBRD and IDA to troubled countries. The BIS as central bank to other central banks facilitates the movement of money. 
They are well known for issuing bridge loans to central banks in countries where IMF or World Bank money is pledged but has not yet been delivered. These bridge loans are then repaid by the respective governments when they receive the funds that have been promised by the IMF or World Bank. The IMF is the BIS ace in the hole when monetary crises hits. The 1998 Brazil currency crisis was caused by that country's inability to pay inordinate accumulated interest on loans made over a protracted period of time. These loans were extended by banks like Citigroup, J.P. Morgan, Chase, and Fleet Boston, and they stood to lose a huge amount of money. The IMF, along with the World Bank and the U.S., bailed out Brazil with a $41.5 billion package that saved Brazil its currency and not incidentally certain private banks. Congressman Bernard Sanders, independent from Vermont, ranking member of the International Monetary Policy and Trade Subcommittee, blew the whistle on this money laundry operation. Sanders' entire congressional press release is worth reading. IMF bailout for Brazil is windfall to banks, disaster for U.S. taxpayers, says Sanders. Burlington, Vermont, August 15th. Congressman Bernard Sanders, independent from Vermont, the ranking member of the International Monetary Policy and Trade Subcommittee, today called for an immediate congressional investigation of the recent $30 billion International Monetary Fund bailout of Brazil. Saunders, who is strongly opposed to the bailout and considers it corporate welfare, wants Congress to find out why U.S. taxpayers are being asked to provide billions of dollars to Brazil and how much of this money will be funneled to U.S. banks such as Citigroup, Fleet Boston, and J.P. Morgan Chase. These banks have about $25.6 in outstanding loans to Brazilian borrowers. U.S. taxpayers currently fund the IMF through a $37 billion line of credit. Saunders said, quote, At a time when we have a $6 trillion national debt, a growing federal deficit, and an increasing number of unmet social needs for our veterans, seniors, and children, it is unacceptable that billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars are being sent to the IMF to bail out Brazil, unquote. Quote, this money is not going to significantly help the poor people of that country. The real winners in this situation are the large, profitable U.S. banks such as Citigroup that have made billions of dollars in risky investments in Brazil and now want to make sure their investments are repaid. This bailout represents an egregious form of corporate welfare that must be put to an end. Interestingly, these banks have made substantial campaign contributions to both political parties, unquote, the congressman added. Saunders noted that the neoliberal policies of the IMF developed in the 1980s, pushing countries towards unfettered free trade, privatization, and slashing social safety nets, has been a disaster for Latin America and has contributed to increased global poverty throughout the world. At the same time that Latin American countries such as Brazil and Argentina follow these neoliberal dictates imposed by the IMF from 1980 to 2000, per capita income in Latin America grew at only one-tenth the rate of the previous two decades. Saunders continued, quote, the policies of the IMF over the past 20 years advocating unfettered free trade, privatizing industry, deregulation, and slashing government investments in health, education, and pensions has been a complete failure for low-income and middle-class families in the developing world and in the United States. Clearly, these policies have only helped corporations in their constant search for the cheapest labor and the weakest environmental regulations. Congress must work on a new global policy that protects workers, increases living standards, and improves the environment, unquote. One can surmise that a financial circle exists where the World Bank helps nations get into debt. Then when these countries can't pay their massive loans, the IMF bails them out with taxpayer money. And in the middle stands the BIS collecting fees as the money travels back and forth like the ocean tide while assuring everyone that all is well. The BIS Bank of International Settlements dumps gold-backed Swiss francs for SDRs. On March 10, 2003, the BIS abandoned the Swiss gold franc as the bank's unit of account since 1930 and replaced it with the SDR.
SDR stands for Special Drawing Rights and is a unit of currency originally created by the IMF.